All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our webinar tonight. It's, uh, it's good to be here with you and it's good to have uh, Jared here with us. Jared, how are you doing? Doing good, doing good, Blake. Thanks for having good. me and hello to everybody. <clears throat> yeah, hopefully everybody can hear us okay. If you're having any problems with uh, the audio, please chat in. Um, I know in the past we've, we've had some issues with with audio, so be sure if you can hear us, maybe uh, send us a little chat to let us know uh, things are streaming okay and you can hear us okay. Um, just a couple housekeeping items too. This will be recorded, so um, we will send this out to everybody, all the registrants afterwards, and we'll also push it through social media and through our email list after, so uh, you'll have a chance to watch this again. Um, you are on mute. All attendees are on mute, but feel free, like I mentioned, to chat in any questions you have. Uh, this is going to be a, really a discussion between uh, Jared and I about this topic. So we would love to hear your feedback and any questions that you have for us, and we will address those. Uh, we'll, we'll watch very closely the questions as they come through so that we can try to get to those and, and help you out. Um, all right, well, let me just quickly introduce myself. Uh, I, I'm Blake Hadley. I am the president of My Social Practice. Uh, we have been in the dental industry for about 12 years now, uh, working specifically with dental practices uh, in digital marketing. We started primarily in social media marketing back in 2009 when everybody was trying to figure out how to use Facebook to market their dental practice. So we jumped on that and we, um, we were kind of first to that space and helping dentists with content and ideas and how to grow their practice through social media. And then since then, we have expanded into helping practices with websites, SEO, reputation management, and kind of anything digital marketing. So um, I've had the chance to speak to thousands of dentists over the years and, and help them with that. So that's something I'm really passionate about. Uh, Jared, could you just introduce yourself quickly and tell us a little bit about Dental Warranty? Sure, you bet. Uh, I'm Jared Parenti. I'm the CEO of Dental Warranty. Uh, we're a unique uh, member of the crowd here in the industry, being the only people that we do, uh, the scale that we do. And so what we provide to the space is a way to do protection plans on your dental treatment in a way where it's a better experience all around and better outcome. Uh, and benefits for your patients and and the practice as well. And so, you know, it's something that uh, dentists have, have done in some capacity on their own for, for a long time. Every good provider stands behind uh, the care that they provide. And, and we found a unique and creative way uh, to, to do it much better together. And so nationwide, um, patients can know that whatever happens, wherever life takes them, whatever adventure that they go on, uh, it's going to be a, a positive outcome uh, in the end. And that's something that I think every dentist, you know, wants to, to provide as part of the care and the, the excellent um, uh, treatment that they give. And so, um, you know, I've been involved with uh, uh, medical practices of all kinds for, for quite a while. And, uh, you know, dentistry has been something I've stuck around in for, for a long time uh, just because it's, it's so darn fascinating and challenging uh, at the same time. So, you know, sticking in the trenches and, and trying to find more ways to help practices and dentists uh, be more engaged with their patients, uh, to build trust and to make that relationship go better is, is something I'm driven by and passionate about um, as well. That's awesome. And, and when we talked earlier, you said you also have uh, quite a bit of experience in marketing as well, that you've kind of, you've helped practices with that as well. And in the past, you've helped other businesses. Is that right? Yeah, and brand, all the way from Forger 5 down through your smallest of medical practice and, and different kinds of those. So um, again, uh, the, the consumer element that's at play, especially in dentistry, uh, as opposed to other areas of medicine is, is, is another thing that's, that's really interesting. And I think we'll get, we'll get into quite a bit of that today. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, Jared and I have known each other for quite a bit of time. I feel like we've always, we're yeah. always running into each other at different conferences and shows, and through the Crown Council as resource partners. And so, uh, we're we're excited to be able to. We've been wanting to do this for a while, so it's this is exciting to be able to to talk on this webinar. 
All right, so the topic um, that we um, have for this is how to build trust online and create loyal patients. Um, we're seeing, as we've talked to many dentists, especially now that there is this issue with trust and dentists um, need help establishing trust online and in practice with patients to um, have more case acceptance, get more new patients and more loyal patients. Uh, a recent Gallup poll said that 61% of Americans say that dentists' honesty and ethical standards are high. So it's only 61%. And when I read that, I was really surprised. You know, that's, some, that's a number that we need to work on as an industry um, to raise so that we can uh, build that trust and um, uh, with patients. So. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Jerry? Why do you think that this is this is an issue? Is this just always kind of been an issue with with uh, medical profession, you know, with the medical profession and dental profession, or why do you think there's um, maybe so much skepticism and a loss of trust right now? Sure. You know, I, I think I might choose to zoom out a little bit more because there's a lot that's at play. I mean, when you, that's a startling number. I think for anybody to hear, if you've never seen anything like that, and there are others that are similar, uh, that are eye-opening, and um, you know, I would I would also throw into the mix, um, you know, related uh, stats about just um, loyalty with businesses in general. I know Gardner came out with a research uh, without with studies a little while back um, about what drives loyalty and or disloyalty, and they got into the weeds as far as um, you know what exactly is it you know that that makes a consumer more loyal uh, or, or apt to choose you to do business with you and um and it's interesting what they come up with it's not what you it's not what you would think and so as they broke open the different parts of that um there, there's a huge focus on just not so much what you are doing as a business or as a as and you can liken this to to your figure with that a dentist and as a practice, not so much what you're doing to drive them away, but perhaps uh, what is happening outside of, of your walls and what is being brought in and just that behavior and that mindset and the way that we're doing business and, and interacting and transacting elsewhere mm -hmm. is really putting uh, the two at odds as, as far as how that goes down. And so that's, I think, a big point to, to, to spell out because, you know, we know how many how many upstanding incredibly ethical you know everyone but the majority of folks in this business in in dental practice are are here for good right. and they want to treat and and make their own patient lives better and uh you know and, and contribute and so it certainly doesn't align with 61 <laughs> percent, you know and uh anyway so i'll Kind of break open some of what the, the Gardner research uh, talks about in terms of, uh, but a little a little hint on it, it. It has to do with effort and how easy or hard for starters it is to interact, um, and and just how smooth that 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 process goes. And so in a in an Amazon economy of here and now or yesterday and how fast things are moving, I think that's the starting point that really kind of separates the two. Yeah, just the convenience and the way in which a uh, consumer interacts with a company. You know, if it's easy to interact with a company, if they don't have to sit on the phone on hold forever, I mean, there's all these yeah. factors that come into that trust that's built and the um, satisfaction of a consumer with a company and with a dentist. They want that process to be easy. And if the process is easy, they're happy and they have more trust. I feel like that's a big part. Right, right. So I'll throw one thing out there just to, to be a little more specific about, about um, what drove all of that, uh, <clears throat> that rant there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what they found is, is that for every interaction with, with a business, that it has a four to one times impact to drive disloyalty mm. with a business than it does loyalty nearly four to one times it's it's crazy so i saw that and it's that that figure moved me as much as the 61 percent and it's just you know so you know anytime i share this everyone's like all right what what the heck are we doing what are we doing wrong right, right. what's what's got to change 
So it's, yeah, it's very, very interesting. So what's maybe there are ways to tackle it. Yeah. So what's maybe an example of that is that four to one, you know, with a dental practice where, you know, something might go wrong and the trust could be broken. Where could you see that happening? You know, for starters, I think it's just making sure you have that human element at play and, and, you know, scratching the surface, those can be obvious differences uh, in terms of how you operate your dental practice. I mean, the difference from answering the phone and, and answering as dental office <laughs> yeah <laughs> versus you know a personal touch and a personal approach and, and that'll come from from just plain caring mm -hmm. uh you know at a, at a at a person to person at a human level um and so easy for everyone out there to do a little bit of a uh, litmus test there and say hey what right. camp are we in um but then you know i think that um i do see a huge huge difference between uh the growth and success of practices who who really commit to and dive into efforts like social media and how can we really keep a, a you know, a belly to belly, like human relationship in this whole process, yep. uh, which is, you know, that's, that's your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And, and yeah, that's what we try to help Dennis do is be transparent, authentic, on social media so that, and you know, everything from obviously what they do in the office is so important, but also what they do online. And um, there are so many things that we can do to build that trust um, in the very beginning in the discovery phase of when uh, someone is trying to find a new practice. Um, I think one, one of the issues too, you know, I think there's probably just an overall skepticism just everywhere of what is seen online, you know, what they hear online. I think that's, that's part of this problem is, you know, even with the pandemic, you know, there was so much information out there, even from medical professionals that all had different opinions, like we didn't know who to believe or what to believe. And I think that's kind right. of transferred over into the dental industry a little bit in that, um, you know, people don't know if, if they can believe or they can trust medical professionals in a way that, that that could be a little bit of an issue and then just right. overall what's said on social media and what we see and you know i was thinking even about this whole oscars uh will uh smith and chris rock right when that right. happened it's like half the people on social media that i follow are saying that it was all staged and half the people were saying it's real and like you can't, you don't know who to trust or what to trust anymore, right? Yes. It's just, and we had heard it all, you know, <laughs> by Monday morning. Yeah, exactly. It was on the internet <laughs> so fast before any further information was even on. Everybody had their opinion. Everybody had, it was just, it was crazy, right? So um, I think that, that dentists have the ability to kind of control their message, have the ability to um, be authentic, be transparent, and, um, and use social proof as well online to, to guide people down that um, new patient journey. So uh, first I wanna talk a little bit about Google uh, cause that's kind of the, one of the biggest uh, factors when it comes to building trust uh, for new patients that are trying to find you. So, uh, what does somebody do a lot of times when they're looking for a dentist, they'll put into Google, you know, dentist near me, right? That's a very commonly searched phrase in dentist near me. And what shows up on that first page of dentist near me? Uh, there's actually three sections that are important to know. The very top section is the PPC pay-per-click is what PPC stands for, pay-per-click ads. And I don't know if you're like me, I usually skip over that whole section. A lot of people do. Uh, they've actually found that 10% of people actually trust the PPC ads at the very top of Google. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that as a dental practice, that you shouldn't maybe pay somebody to help you with some PPC ads because you can still get some clicks, but it's important for you to know that a lot of people skip over that. And a lot of people just don't trust that section because they, they know that the companies or the dentists with the big bucks, they're the ones putting the ads there, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best option. So just something to be aware of. And then when you scroll down, um, if you scroll kind of down to the bottom of the first page, there's the organic 
results. And what that means is basically if a dental practice is, uh, maybe pays an SEO agency to um, put certain keywords in blog posts or on their website, or has um, maybe has a really good PR campaign to have a lot of different websites blog about that practice, or there's a lot of links that go to their, that practice. There's a lot of SEO strategies that you can do but you'll show up in those organic results. Uh, they've found that about 27% of people trust those organic results. So even if you show up first in that section, uh, kind of towards the bottom of that first page, it still doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's gonna trust that you're the best option. But the place that they found uh, people trust the most is the middle section. And that's your, where Google Maps, it's your local listings that show up. They found that 68% of people trust that Google Maps results. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, people are looking for a dentist near them. You know, that's what they search, dentist near me. They wanna see who's the closest to where they live. And then obviously the second reason is reviews. This is where the reviews are. Uh, it's your Google My Business listing. And this is what shows how many reviews you have and your average uh, score of reviews. And that's what people want to know. That's what we call a social proof, right? People want to find out what other people think about you, uh, how many people, you know, are writing reviews for your practice, and then what the average score is. Um, I found it really interesting. I was reading a, an article about this, and it said that um, people, if, if your review score isn't at least a 4.0, your average review score, that people don't even, they kind of just skip over. If it, if it has a three at the very beginning, oh. they, they look for a different option. They're like, nope, <laughs> there's a three there. I, I don't feel good about this practice. And then another thing that they found is if you have less than 40 reviews, so even if you have all five-star reviews, but less than 40 of them, they also skip over your practice. They look for the practice that has more reviews than 40. So that's just something to think about. Um, you need to be sure you have over 40 reviews and you need to make, make sure that you have an over a 4.0 average. And this just means, you know, for the average, you just need to get more reviews. You know, we used to say at uh, my social practice, we used to advise practices to, only ask the patients that you know will give you a positive review to, to leave you a review. Um, so that is one strategy, but it, it, by doing that, you know, you may not get a lot of reviews and as, as many reviews. And when a negative review comes up, it might bring down your average. So we have kind of changed our view on this. We, we suggest that really you ask everybody, you kind of have an automated service that asks everybody to leave you a review. This does mean you probably will get some negative reviews, but they'll hopefully be drowned out by your positive reviews. So you can have more reviews and then hopefully, unless you're just a horrible dentist, <laughs> hopefully you'll have a higher average um, rating, right? So that's something real, to think about. Yeah. yeah, can I throw something in real quick? Yes, please. Uh, since this, you guys are doing this day in and day out, uh, have, have you guys <clears throat> come across or done any study into uh, the difference between, you know, if you got like 800 reviews and it's 5.0 versus a solid number up and 4.7, 4 4.8. 4 <laughs> I mm -hmm. think this back to that authenticity point, there's something to be said here. Yeah, yeah, and that's interesting too because sometimes when it looks too perfect, it's it's it could be a negative. Uh, you know, it it feels like the practice either game the system or only you know it it is actually good to get some negative reviews as long as you res respond to all those reviews. Sometimes it is good to have that four point eight, you know, that four point six. As long as you have a lot of them. People understand that once in a while somebody comes in and they just, no matter what, they have a bad experience, they're just having a bad day or whatever, right? And people understand right. that and they're, they're more forgiving and they, and they like to see that transparency and that authenticity for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there, there are many great relationships and there's actually a lot of loyalty 
that can be born out of potentially, you know, tricky situations where you have the opportunity though to to go above and beyond and to correct something. Because look, I mean, life life isn't isn't perfect, and <laughs> that goes for everything. Uh, and so we all know that as human beings. And so especially if you've got somebody who's prospective patient who's looking over your list of reviews and they're able to see how you responded. And, and then again, m- most of the time they can read between the lines. Mm-hmm. Patients are smart, right? Yeah, they can tell yeah. when something was unreasonable on the other end or just totally out of, out of line as far as expectations and that you've done everything uh, that any great practice and, and you know, care provider yeah. would, would, would do. Oh, totally. um, it, it was interesting, Jared and I were talking a little bit, and even if somebody, sometimes, even if it seems that someone has a great experience in your office, sometimes they'll even leave you a, a negative review or something that even seems <laughs> negative, right? And so you never really yes. know what people are going to gonna write on your, your page. It's, it's wild west. Um, look, so we've got a, uh, looks like we've got somebody shouting in here, a chat. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, she says, how, how would you suggest handling the negative reviews when they don't reflect your practice? Yeah, I mean, this happens all the time. I think if you're just professional and how you address them, be sure to address all negative reviews. It's really bad if you don't address a negative review because then it's just left like that, you know, and people do read the negative ones. I mean, I even go to businesses sometimes and I filter it. So I see the negative reviews first, so I can read those. So you probably do that too. You want to see, you want to see what's really this business is all about. But, you know, I also read the responses from the practice. And so um, as long as the practice is very professional about, you know, how they respond to it and they address the concern and don't, you know, snap on that person and say well you're wrong and i'm right you know that that means a lot too and how they're going to handle me as a patient if i don't agree with something you know i I think that professional way of and of addressing things is is so important so absolutely and then the only thing i'd add to that is you've got to find you know your own comfort level of of exactly what kind of detail uh, to to include, there's lots of things that play there. We don't need to, to get into all of that, but I think that generally, if you're, you know, if you're courteous uh, and and inviting them to get back in touch and to work together and to talk it through, I think that's that's some pretty solid guidance as far as as what to put out there. Uh, so you don't feel like you have to air all the all the laundry per se. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very true. Um, something else I kind of wanted to address on this, as far as this building trust, uh, when someone Googles you or Google's dentist near me, we did a big research um, kind of study about how much reviews affected where somebody ranks in that map section. And we found that the practices with the most reviews and the highest rank didn't necessarily always rank at the very top of the map section. And we, we kind of thought that that's what we would find is if you have a lot of reviews and a lot of positive reviews, you would always kind of be at the top as the top suggested, but that's not the case. Um, Google factors <clears throat> in a lot of different things um, uh, for that. And there are some other things that play into what shows up first. And a big part of this is how you optimize your Google My Business uh, account, your Google My Business listing. And there's a lot of things that you can do um, if you have, hopefully you have admin access of your Google My Business listing. Uh, They have a back end that you can go in, you can add your services, you can add all the locations uh, around your practice that you service. Um, you can do a whole bunch of things in there that will optimize that page. So it will show up higher in the map section. And they found that if you, if you can rank in those top three on that front page as one of the suggested practices, uh, you will get, I think the top three get something like 92% of the business. And they get like 45% of the clicks too, if you can be those top, it's called the three pack, it's the Google Maps three pack, just to be on that front page. So I would advise, you know, just for showing up at the top, that builds trust. And so go into your Google My Business account, 
optimize it, add as much as you can. Everything that Google suggests you do, do it. Add, write a really good bio, um, add posts to your Google My Business. Um, there's things that we can do at My Social Practice too to help you with that, but that's, uh, you know, that's just, it's kind of perception is reality, right? If you show up high, people believe that, oh, Google, they trust Google, that Google is going to tell them what they need, right? <laughs> right, right. And, you know, good way to think about that too. I mean, the two most important people in that equation, the mix, you know, being Google and your prospective patients are both just monster consumers of, of information. Mm -hmm. They won't be want information. So even the smallest stuff is making sure your profiles are complete. And um, some of the stuff may seem silly or redundant or unnecessary, uh, but if you do it, that's one step in, in the right direction in terms of boosting what, what everyone in that mix wants to see. Totally, yep. And um, so this kind of brings us to your full online presence. You know, people nowadays are going online looking at everything they can find about you before they pick up the phone to call you, right? They're going to the Google My Business profile. They're looking at all your photos there. They're even finding that people aren't necessarily even going to the website because websites now, even though you have to have a website, it's so important to have a website, but website is what you have created. Like it's your perfect, the perfect you, right? Of everything. So instead people are going to social media. They want to see the real you. They want to see what patients are posting about you. They, it feels, social media feels more authentic. So it's important that you have a really good social media presence. Um, it's important that, you know, the, what's the top page on your website that gets visited the most out of any other page? Your about page. Right, they want to see the faces of the, your team members. They want to read about who you are. Um, you know, I I have never gone to a service page and read about how a dentist does a dental implant. Like that's right. Like no, <laughs> <laughs> fascinating. I, I've never read that. But I do want to know who the dentist is and what the team. You know, who they are and what they care about and how they treat their patients. That's the experience. I want to understand more about the experience. I don't really, even though it's important, I don't, in that phase, I don't really care as much about the technical, uh, you know, dentistry that you might think that they care, people care about, but people care more about that experience, right? Absolutely. And it does, you know, we talk about this all the time uh, when it comes to, to, you know, why you need to think through the things uh, that we encourage you think through as a practice, because it, it's hardly ever is about uh, you know, a clinical outcome per se. I mean, it, it's all connected. Don't get me wrong here, but uh, thinking about that journey end to end and what it was like uh, to go th through that and, and the connection and the interaction and how smooth that was uh, all outside of the technical specs uh, trumps everything else. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So as far as social media goes, you know, I get asked all the time too, what type of things should I post on my social media accounts? What type of things will build trust? What type of things are people looking for? Um, you know, should I focus on my followers, getting more followers on Instagram? And um, I, I do believe that it is, it is important to try to build your followers on Facebook and on Instagram, I think people look at that number, no matter what, it's just kind of human nature. We look at that number, we see, oh, how many people like this person, right? That's that social proof type of thing. How many people follow this practice? So it is important that you work on that number to just, you know, just start with your patients, try to get them to follow you on Instagram, um, you know, like you on, on Facebook. Um, but then when it comes to content, uh, creating, authentic content show your team show uh, your practice um, you know we have over the years we have pushed our practices to not focus so much on when we first started social media we would help practices just kind of post graphics right like a, yeah it was like, <laughs> it was like a graphic that was informational about you know dentistry, you know, or a holiday or whatever it might be. And, and graphics are still okay to post once in a while. It's good to show you're consistent. If you just throw up a graphic, um, it just kind of shows that you're there, that you're available, that someone is in charge of your social media accounts. You're watching them at least, right? Um, and, that, and I kind of see it as 
space fillers, right? But the most important type of content that you can be posting are authentic photos of your team, videos, um, show the charities you're involved with, show how you contribute to the community, how you support local businesses. Um, you know, stop just talking about dentistry on your, on your social media accounts. That's not why people are going to social media accounts necessarily. Uh, they just kind of want to see who you are and what you're about. If you do talk about dentistry, you know, there's kind of been this whole movement towards really educating patients, but in a fun and interesting way. And that's why we talk about TikTok a lot. And when I talk about TikTok, sometimes I get you know, practices, people rolling their eyes at me, like, oh my gosh, why are you, why do you want me to do TikTok videos, right? It's just, it's just teenagers dancing and, and, uh, you know, why would I ever make a TikTok video uh, for my practice? I don't want you to think of it as a TikTok video and the stigma that comes with that. Think of it as a short form piece of con educational piece of content where you can address maybe some of these FAQs um, in an interesting and fun way. And um, so what, I, what we're seeing practices do and dentists do is um, you know, talking about some of these common misconceptions in dentistry um, through a fun video, you know, pointing at different information or putting some fun music over the top, but ed educating in a fun way. Um, we're seeing practices show treatment in a quick way, you know, TikTok and Reels allow you to cut quickly to, um, or do like a time lapse, time lapse video to show a longer treatment or procedure in a very short way, and you can put captions over the top and music, so it makes it really interesting. Um, so those type of videos are really, really powerful right now, and we're really pushing our practices to to focus on video content because it's it's just doing so well on social media and you know in, in the end that's that's why people go to social media is to be entertained they want to they want information and to be entertained and that's a, a perfect mix and so when it comes to content just be thinking about video and how you can use you know short form video to um, build that trust as well. You don't have to, you don't have to dance and be goofy, you know, that, that can maybe, if you're too goofy or if it's too weird, that can maybe hurt a little bit of the trust. You want to be a little careful, right? But you can still have some fun with it and, um, and, and use it as a, as a platform to educate. So. Yes, absolutely. I think that, you know, only thing I would add and, and encourage is that you find your voice. I think mm -hmm. that in order for you to be authentic and for it to be translated and received, uh, you know, a, in a positive way that that has, you know, high impact and, and does what you want it to do is to be sure you find your voice. And it might take, you know, some time uh, for you to get into that groove. And just, you know, I, I, I laugh kind of thinking about when you started talking about the onset and, and your early days and, and what social media looked like then mm -hmm. and the early adopters uh, in different small businesses and, and in medical practices, dental practices. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, a waste of time. I'm not going to get my patients here. Um, you know, they're not something where they're looking for, for a dentist. And, and even to this day, I would, I would say that, that I would, I would agree with that for the most part, except the fact that our lives are not siloed like that anymore right we're yeah. we're all about engagement everywhere all the time and yeah. that's where they live and and um so this is your opportunity to to share um who you are in a way that's not about you know clinical uh you know treatment you, you get to have your your prospective patients get to know you and to hear you and to to um you know resonate uh with who you are and that just brings a comfort level up to a totally different level that before now would have been extremely difficult uh, or impossible to, to do. Oh. And so looking at it that way, it doesn't have to be a lot, um, but just make sure it's authentic you. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's that's probably, you know, we talk about finding your why first, you know, you gotta find yes. your voice, you gotta find why you're on social media, what your purpose is, and then, and then uh, you know, continue with that. Um, one other thing I want to address really quickly in this discovery phase two, before we jump into kind of building loyalty with your patients after they find you and after they, um, you know, schedule their appointment. 
um, is this idea of working with some influencers. Uh, I've talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, influencers is a really big part of social media. And the reason why is because people trust what other people say more than what you say these days. So you can keep pushing your message as much as you want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people will trust you. So working with influential people um, to, to have them promote you and talk about you is a better way to do that. Now, one thing I would uh, think about is to start with your current patients that already believe in you and know you and like you. And you'll probably find that some of your current patients aren't necessarily influencers, meaning they have hundreds and thousands of followers on social media, but maybe they're just kind of influencers in their own small space, meaning maybe they have a thousand followers or maybe not even that 1000 to 2000, whatever 500 follow followers or friends on social media that live locally in your area. Doesn't really matter if you have if you're working with someone that has hundreds of thousands of followers and they're all across the country that will never come into your practice. But if there's someone that's just likable that you work with that has a little bit of a following, you could work with that person to encourage them to post on their social media accounts and talk about you and tag you with maybe a little bit of an incentive. Maybe you give them a little bit of a discount or, or you know, on their treatment or whatever it might be in exchange for them talking about you online. So that's where I would start. Think about your current patients, maybe ask your team in your next team huddle, say who, you know, who are some of our patients that you know, probably have a little bit of a following on social media that would be willing to talk about us and start there uh, with these kind of micro influencers. And um, that's an incredible way to build trust. And we see it work really well with dental practices. Nice. Like, I love that advice. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think understanding that for a while, uh, but hearing you package it up that way uh, and make it applicable and relevant for, for our audience is is huge because that's not you know that's not super obvious i think to a mm -hmm. lot of dental teams um but it, but it's super powerful yeah so I, I like i like how you spun that up yeah my uh, my cousin uh lives in arizona and she's a photographer she probably has maybe two thousand followers on her photography instagram account and she's just a really likable person everybody that knows her just loves her and the practice saw this and they didn't think of her as, you know, she wasn't a giant influencer that she didn't even, she doesn't label herself as an influencer, but they just said, hey, you know, we'd love to help you with, she had some, um, uh, some veneers done and said, you know, they gave her a discount and she did some posts. Um, they captured kind of her reaction when she first saw her veneers, which was really uh, sincere and authentic. And she posted that and people believed her because she wasn't trying to be like this influencer where people like, oh, she must get paid. She, she's an actress, right? She just acted like that because she's getting paid. Like they believe her because she didn't have a big, huge following. And she was just, she's one of their friends. They knew her. And so that it's just a lot more powerful if, for dentists to work with those type of people. Um, Anyways, um, let's, we have one more question from Denise. Would you consider followers more important than engagement? Um, I would consider engagement more important than followers. Engagement is meaning people liking, commenting, and sharing your posts because these are your true believers in you. These are your advocates, right? These are your um, ambassadors that love you and want to talk, you know, or want to comment and want to interact with you. Um, followers is still important because that kind of perception, but people are buying followers and people are, I mean, accounts are buying fake followers just to build up, up that number. So engagement are your real fans that you want to, you know, focus on. So. Yes, absolutely. So one thing comes to mind real quick uh, before we move on, and I've seen this this whole paradigm just flip on its head. Uh, and there's a ton of people out there that I know would, would uh, counter me on this. And I, and I, and I think I know where they would go with that. And I agree with them in terms of just how much is going on in our lives. So from the standpoint of, of, um, you know, number and volume, when it comes to content, uh, there's something to be said about 
being there at the right time. And mm-hmm. sometimes the only, the only way to get there is volume. Yep. Constant. Right. So there's without you know, going off on a tangent there, um, there is so much content today <laughs> that it's really, really easy just to be more writing, you know, on, on, on the wall and just mm-hmm. to contribute to the noise. So a lot of, of smart marketers today understand that um, while there's an element to that timeliness and being there at the right time, which can come through volume, uh, you're better off a little bit of a slower build, but more meaningful, authentic mm-hmm. engagement and, and making it about that. I mean, because after all, that, that's what everyone's really about. You look at the, the old days of Google and it was all about volume and yeah. you could game that all day long. And, and all of those algorithms are getting smarter to understand more about us as people. So signals and yeah. connections and things that can be less fabricated. It's a great point. And, and Instagram and Facebook, they favor content that gets engagement, meaning they're, you know, they don't show things in a chronological order. So you can post all the time, but the, the things that they you know, they believe that they can show the users what they really want to see, right? So then they base that off of engagement. So if something's getting more engagement, they say, oh, this must be interesting content. Let's, let's show this at the top of the feed so that more people see it. And so, you know, partly like Jared says, you know, you need to come up with engaging content. And if you can do that, then as you get more engagement, it will then show more people that content. So it, it favors you in, in a couple of different ways. All right, so that's a little bit just about, um, you know, kind of that discovery phase of how to build trust in, uh, for new patients. Now let's talk about the retention phase, how to build loyalty, um, you know, showing you for more case acceptance, showing your patients that you really care um, when you talk about treatments, how, you know, how to talk about it. And, and, you know, Jared probably has maybe some more, uh, insight on this uh, with the protection plans. I mean, this is a big sure. part of building trust with treatment, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, again, there's so many different things that, and elements that you can sprinkle in here. Um, but at the core of that is, is authenticity, and, you know, one thing I'll just, I'll throw out there, you know, sometimes when we, when we talk to a practice or a dental team for the first time, and they're kind of absorbing what it is that we do, uh, their first reaction could be, well, like, we're, we're great practitioners, like we don't, you know, our, our treatment doesn't fail, our treatment doesn't break, it doesn't, you know, and, and I'll find it, I'll find it good, but, but there's so much about that, that you truly cannot control. And, and you know, there's something that we've tapped into that, that bigger brands who know loyalty and people in and out have tapped into for a long, long time. And what that is, is, is addressing the long-term experience with a product or a service earlier in the decision-making process. So in the buying decision, how, how secure can we help our, our customers feel with what it's going to be like after this first interaction mm-hmm. and what that's, what that's gonna be like. And then finding creative ways to bundle in and provide more of that as part of the buying decision. And so bringing that back into to dental treatment, exactly what we seek to do is recognizing that, you know, our, our patients have extraordinary adventurous lives, you know, beyond our doors at the dental practice. And so being able to couple the excellent treatment that you provide with a wherever you go, whatever may come type of, of kind of just warm blanket, patients love that. It has little to do with, um, with the quality and the standard, standard of care. In fact, it has nothing to do with it. It, it has to do more with what we're seeking and, and how we can make patients feel about the overall experience packaged with that, with that treatment. Well, and that's so, so that's so interesting. Yeah, and, you know, the Amazon mentality right and even ordering anything online taking it away from dentistry the first thing that i look at when i'm about to order something online is what's the return policy right like i want to (laughs) know how hard is this going to be to return you know how much is it going to cost me to return or how you know how difficult is it going to be and so so you're right like people think about 
what's my experience going to be later after I receive the product or the service or whatever? Like, what if something goes wrong or what, you know, what then, you know, people are thinking about that. Right, right. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about the things that they're not voicing, at least in that moment. There are a lot of un, unasked questions that you make no mistake, it's impacting the outcome and whether or not, you know, a certain patient will choose to accept um, and or buy into what you are, what you're encouraging them to do uh, for their health and for their well-being. And so all of these things are at play and, and can make a big, a big impact on, on the direction that it goes. Um, so that's, yeah, that's our world day in and day out. And you know, interestingly enough, so of course, we'd, we'd invite and love to have, you know, any practice join in and, and reap the benefits and have happier patients, more acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. But there's so much actually that, that I love about the conversation here that we end up having great conversations. Uh, and, and I'm happy whether or not you end up partnering with us to, to, to do that together, because there's a lot to, to, that you can do, actually. Uh, even if you're not partnered with with our company to provide, you know, a formal protection plan like that. Um, and there, there's a certain level of that assurance and those things that you can do and say that can get you at least a good part of the way there uh, in terms of, of higher confidence and, and more acceptance up front. Mm -hmm. What are maybe a few kind of tips as you're talking with a patient and trying to get them to accept treatment? Maybe what are a few things to think about? I, meaning... You know, obviously you want to think about the, their financial situation and you want to think about this idea of, a, you know, protection plan. And maybe what are, what are a few of the ways to, um, to build that confidence? I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, if I'm sitting there in the chair and I've had the practice uh, suggest a few things to me, I'm trying to think what would be the, <clears throat> what would be the things that he or she would say that would kind of push me over the edge and make me feel better about it. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts or tips on, on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, we're only a piece of the, of the puzzle here. And, and there are some you know, phenomenal um, consultants out there that, that will coach on some things that make all the difference. And it, and it starts a little before we even come into the mix with, with the protection mm -hmm. plan. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just relay, I'll relay some of those things uh, that you've got to get right. And, um, you know, you, you raised a good point about the financial situation. I think what divides great practices and, and okay practices in terms of acceptance of care and, and that kind of thing is just a sheer confidence level in what it is that you are giving, uh, what it is that you're offering. If you are more concerned about the financial side of this than your patient is, it's, it's not going to work as well as you, mm. you like, mm. it, and, and they're not going to buy into, um, you know, selling is a bad word in this, but you, it's all about what it is you're selling. Mm. You're selling them good health benefits that are going to last them a lifetime. They, they can do things in their life uh, better than they could before. I mean, we all know how much our oral health uh, plays into our overall well-being, right? So if you believe that, sell that all day long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, that is absolutely an incredible. And what, what better of a thing could you sell somebody? Uh, so, you know, that's uh, making it as easy as possible. And so you can't, you can't give too many reasons for them not to feel comfortable with, with what you're providing and the care you're going to provide uh, early in the process. Otherwise they're, they're not going to, they're not going to move with you there. Um, and then there's a lot of different strategy in terms of the way you present information. Uh, and make sure that you pay attention to natural psychology and the way we make decisions. You know, a lot of practices uh, give too much. You know, you've obviously got to do your due process and, and you've got to ethically provide options, mm -hmm. uh, but too many options uh, without clear direction and reason for it, it just breeds one thing and that's indecision um, for starter. So mm -hmm. making sure you're very clear in what it is you're recommending and strongly recommend it. Um, and then uh, there's, there's a lot to be said about the way that you present and organize what's on paper, uh, how you present those options in the form of a treatment plan. And if you're going to itemize it all out into every procedure and every detail, uh, or if you want to give it to your patients in, in easy to understand, easy to digest uh, terms. And so a lot of, 
you out there in practice will understand that as a non-itemized treatment plan or versus an itemized. And I realize, you know, we all know that that uh, if you're an in-network practice with insurance, you've got to file and bill it a certain way and there's disclosure and there's things that you want your patient to understand. It's certainly not about, about uh, you know, hiding anything uh, about the treatment plan. But um, again, if you give anybody a long laundry list of details, they're going to shop it. And they're going to under, they're going to want to know like well do I really need this do I really need that do I and all of a sudden the focus is no longer on uh you know your your purpose as a as a good practitioner to get them good health and to get them where they need to go where they want to go it's on you know nitpicky detail and and things that are not about uh the outcome and help them get there and so again you you're going to have your high detail people that say hey yeah I want to know I want to see it and that's fine give it to them uh, but certainly don't do that before <laughs> before you find out that it's someone who who wants and needs that level that level of detail. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, I'm I'm diving into a lot there, but but you know we we those things are so so important when it comes to to the kind of impact you're going to be able to have on your patients' lives. Um, they're they're hinging, they're pivotal moments for yeah. sure. Yeah, I love I love those. Those are those are great tips. And you know, I think yeah, you know, as you talk about even the word plan, as you talk about treatment plan, protection plan, um, membership plan, whatever. I think whenever you can get someone on a plan, <laughs> that always will create some loyalty, right? Whether it's you, you, if you can lay things out in a way that makes sense for the future, and and I think that builds a lot of loyalty and a lot of trust. And like, okay, I see where the doctor or the team wants to take me, I'm part of a plan, you know, I'm part of this membership plan. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with them for a while to try to carry, carry this out. Right. If they, if they can like lay that out in a, in a clear way to me, and that that's a lot of <clears throat> pressure on the team to be able to talk about it correctly. And, you know, to educate about these things in, in a really good way, but uh, it's so important to, um, try to get people on a plan for loyalty. Uh, some of the other thoughts that I had just for, um, you know, to keep a patient loyal to you and, and create a lifetime patient, there are some things that you can do with social media and with your online reputation that will help create that loyalty. Um, I don't, if you've heard of Robert Cialdini, he's a favor, uh, famous psychologist <clears throat> that came up with the six principles of persuasion. Basically, he felt that if you could do, and there's six ways to basically persuade anybody to do what you want them to do. And one of them was, um, talks about um, having, if you can get someone to commit to something small, then if they, they'll commit to bigger things in the future. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of things that you can do to get people to commit to you in small ways, um, even taking a photo with someone. If you can ask somebody, hey, could you take a photo with me? I, you know, we, we loved your visit today. We'd love to post about you on our social media accounts. Of course, get HIPAA consent to do that. But if, you know, taking a photo with someone means kind of a lot, right? Like, hey, you're my friend. Like, I want to show you off that you're my friend to all of our followers. And and I think it's some, it makes people feel good, you know, to take that photo. If they agree to do it, that's a small commitment. You put them up on your social media accounts. Like they feel good. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of part of this practice, right? Uh, the small commitment of just keep following you on Instagram or Facebook, that requires somebody to, you know, say, okay, I want to see more of your content. I want to follow you. It's like a little commitment, right? But again, it kind of, it's that opt-in to saying like, Hey, we're, we're closer. We're, we're tighter, right? We talked about this leaving a review. That's a huge commitment. If someone will take the time to leave you a review online, and then if you respond to that review, even if it's negative or positive, like, that feels good to someone like, Oh, I, I told them how much I like them. I told the world how much I like them. And they responded and they thanked me like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm part of their group, right? They, they like me and I like them and I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep uh, working with them in the future. Um, something else that's I've always thought is, would be a good strategy for practices is you know, the, the yearly birthday card 
it just isn't enough anymore for dental practices. <laughs> you can do so much more now to um, secure your friendship and your commitment by following them on social media and, you know, commenting on things that are happening in their life. You know, they, they had a baby, you say, congratulations, it, you know, something happens. It's like, it's this commitment and this relationship that you're building with your patients that will make them care so much more about you than that impersonal um, birthday card, right? So there's things that you can do, these small commitments, like little things that, um, you know, psychologically make people feel like they're more part of your practice and they'll be loyal patients uh, forever, hopefully, right? That's huge. I love that. I like, uh, you know, we all know what we've experienced ourselves, right? Those little acts um, of sentiment, right? Like mm -hmm. that means so much more even than, than some, you know, awesome, incredible material gifts. Just put those just deposits and that interest in, in you as a person that, mm -hmm. that'll definitely, uh, you know, buy you big, big points where you can be a bigger part of their life and, and uh, mm -hmm. vice versa over yeah. time. So that's, that's huge. Love it. And it kind of keeps you top of mind and, you know, um, yeah. So that's kind of all the thoughts we have. We're kind of, we ran out of time. I know we had a little bit of technical difficulties earlier, <laughs> but we're still kind of on the hour. If, if you have any other questions, feel free to chat them in and we'll kind of, I'll look for those for just a minute. Is there anything else, uh, Jared, that you wanted to add to the conversation or we kind of covered most of it <laughs> we got into a lot and definitely some conversation starters we might have to do part two here um <laughs> yeah. or even part three so we're not just uh I, I know i went on a few runs and and so much of that I, that i'd probably love to unpack and slow down and and uh and talk through and get feedback from the crowd and and really dial up an awesome conversation so let's think about doing that i think yeah uh, it's been a good hour yeah let's do it again for sure there's so many uh, small things that, uh, yeah, I would love to expand on as well, but all right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in and thanks so much, Jared, for, uh, you know, being part of this and um, we will schedule something again soon. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Blake. All thanks, right. Everybody. Take care. Okay. We'll see you. Bye.